Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bernie Luburn, and yes, I am the son of a Ritchie boy. My late father, Walter Luburn, was a German immigrant who fled to the United States alone in September 1938. To me, he was the epitome of what the Ritchie boys represent. Now I'm going to bring up the slides. and start the formal program. Uh, slide one is a picture of the main entrance at Fort Ritchie, Camp Ritchie. Um, the castle building that you see um, served as the headquarters of Camp Ritchie and was modeled after the castle insignia of the US Army Corps of Engineers who built the building. Now I've used Fort Ritchie, Camp Ritchie. Um, the period that we're talking about was, the facility was known as Camp Ritchie. After it closed in 1946, the army renamed it Fort Ritchie and it uh, continues at that name. I want to talk a little bit, give you some background on U.S. military intelligence. Um, America's use of military intelligence capabilities can be traced back to George Washington and his use of spies and scouts during his command of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. There were few advancements in military intelligence during the first half of the 19th century beyond development of mapping capabilities. Military leaders continued to rely on spies and scouts. Military intelligence during the Civil War was decentralized on both sides. The Union Army established a Bureau of Military Intelligence that relied heavily on scouts and interrogation of Confederate prisoners. However, at the end of the Civil War, the military quickly forgot the organizations and concepts that it had developed slowly and painfully during wartime. And this is a story that repeats itself. In 1885, the Mil Army created the Military Information Division. And uh, its main function was to gather information on foreign armies, and that's uh, following the creation by Congress of the military attache position. And that's where we collected most of our military intelligence between the late 1800s and really up until World War I was the use of military attaches. Now you can imagine these were people who would have social events with military leaders in the countries where they reported to, and that's where they gathered their information. In World War I, the uh, Army established a military intelligence division, distinguishing it from the previous military information division. And um, that military intelligence division focused a lot on cryptology and counterintelligence. Again, after World War I, Budgets were wound down and no funding was set aside for military intelligence. It was only as the winds of war approached that the U.S. Army decided to revitalize its resources. Now, as we all know, in Europe, there were major developments taking place in the 20s and 30s. Germany began a secret rearmament program. Adolf Hitler assumed power April 1st, 1933. The Nuremberg Laws were passed in 1935, which placed many restrictions on the activities of Jewish residents. March 38 was the Anschluss with Austria. And in the summer of 38 was the Evian concert uh, conference, 
which was an attempt to try to get countries to take Jewish refugees. Only Dominican Republic was the only country that stepped forward. Later in 1938 was the Kristallnacht. German families were frightened about their future and tried to emigrate. Um, but it was difficult. There was no appetite in this country for increased immigration. In February of 1939, the Wagner Bill was defeated. It would have added 20,000 children immigrants to the United States. So Jews across Europe faced strict immigration quotas and restrictions. And um, a lot of Americans were concerned about possible fifth column from immigrants. Immigrants who did make it to the United States were further restricted by the War Powers Act that prevented them from joining the, the military. Now, this is a very important personality. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Colonel Raymond E. Lee. The photo you see in the upper left was him during World War II. He had been awarded the Distinguished Service Medal and became the U.S. military attache to Great Britain. And he served from 1935 to 41. While in England, he understood the need for more sophisticated intelligence gathering in the event of a war. Britain was gearing up for a war and they were building their military infrastructure and intelligence infrastructure. Colonel Lee was a strong supporter of England and Churchill and Britain overall. He realized that Britain was much better prepared than the United States was. And he wrote a lot of memos and requests back to the United States, urging the creation and development of military preparedness. One thing that he was, uh, up against was Ambassador Joseph Kennedy. Uh, Ambassador Kennedy thought Britain would be quickly defeated by Germany and therefore refused to support requests for aid. Colonel Lee operated behind the scenes, sending his reports to the military leadership. Eventually, Ambassador Kennedy lost favor in Washington and Colonel Lee's request uh, took on greater importance. While he was still in London, he advocated for a joint intelligence committee. This preceded the National Security Council, the OSS, the CIA, and his idea was to give the army, the ability to gather intelligence and get estimates of army activities in other countries. The, the, government, the army was reluctant, but changed after Roosevelt, President Roosevelt appointed Bill Donovan as the head of the OSS. Established in mid 1941, the J IC Joint Intelligence Committee started up on September 10, 1941. The first meeting was held December 9th, 1941. Now, Colonel Lee returned to the United States, landed on December 7th, 1941, the day that the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor very fortuitous that he arrived. The, the then acting director of the Army's military intelligence was discharged 
And on January 1st, he, uh, Rick, uh, Colonel Lee was promoted to Brigadier General and became the number two person in the G2, which was the Army Intelligence unit within the general staff. There are five general staff functions. Intelligence is G2. General Lee realized that there were a lot of shortcomings in our military intelligence operations. He knew that the military war department need, needed to take it very seriously. Unlike in Britain, US immigrants were prohibited from serving in the military based on the War Powers Act of 1924. Yet General Lee realized that these foreigners had a strong desire to fight under the American flag, but they were prevented from doing so. We had tens of thousands of immigrants from Europe who were eligible for army service. He understood that these immigrants would be of great value to the armed forces as an advance guard in landing operations in their homelands. He argued for repeal of the War Powers Act, and in March 1942, Congress passed the second War Powers Act, which provided for expedited naturalizations of non-citizens serving in the armed forces, whether in the US or serving overseas. And that's how Ritchie boys were able to become citizens. Most of them did not have citizenship when they joined the army and they received their citizenship either in basic training or perhaps even at Camp Ritchie or even in the European theater of operations. Now beyond the uh, ideas that General Lee had, the military realized that it needed some type of a training center to really upgrade capabilities in military intelligence. And that brings me to Camp Ritchie. Originally, it was built in 1926 to be the summer training camp for the Maryland National Guard. The U.S. Army took it over in early 1942 and named it Camp Ritchie after Maryland's long-serving governor, Albert Ritchie. The Army considered Camp Ritchie to be an ideal location. It's located northeast of Hagerstown, Maryland, near the Pennsylvania border. It was an isolated and secluded area, but relatively close to Washington, D.C. It opened as Camp Ritchie on June 19, 1942, as the Military Intelligence Training Center, or MITC. Later, the Army established a subcamp, Camp Sharp, on the battlefields of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to train soldiers in psychological operations. Here's a map. Here's a map of Washington County. And if you look in the northeastern part, you'll see Fort Ritchie Military Reservation just above South Mountain. It's adjacent to the Appalachian Trail. And if you've ever been up to that area, you know how isolated and secluded it is. Now, who were the Ritchie boys? Other than Christian Bauer's documentary film, The Ritchie Boys, released in 2004, and Bruce Henderson's book, Sons and Soldiers, published in 2017, and some personal memoirs, there's very little information on Camp Ritchie and <clears throat> its operations. As a, as a result, there are a lot of misconceptions about the operations of Camp Ritchie. For example, 
there is a belief <clears throat> that a majority of soldiers that trained at Camp Ritchie were Jewish. As you can see from this slide, that was not the case. Nearly half were immigrants born outside the United States. And that is a fact. So who were the Ritchie boys? There were approximately 20,000 soldiers that trained at Camp Ritchie and Camp Sharp. Immigrants from many European countries. There were a dozen African Americans. There were women in the Women's Army Corps, the WACs. And there were Japanese American, Nisai, who trained at Camp Ritchie. How did they end up there? Well, from the high command in the US military, orders were sent out to each and every military base requesting of the command commanders that any soldiers with European language proficiency be pulled out and sent to Camp Ritchie. <clears throat> Many times soldiers would be in their basic training. They would be called into the office of the commandant and told, you are leaving tomorrow, pack your bags. You're going to Camp Ritchie. They would ask, what's Camp Ritchie? And they would be told, top secret, we can't tell you. Now, of course, a lot of um, Ritchie boys came from universities or directly from other army uh, situations. A lot of the American born soldiers had lived overseas with their families, either as missionaries or maybe they studied abroad. Uh, many of them had French, German, Italian literature degrees from universities in the United States, and they were tapped and sent directly to Camp Ritchie. According to research by Dan Gross and historian Beverly Eddy, who's writing a book of Camp Ritchie to be published this summer, there were 26 general training classes at Camp Ritchie. The main subjects taught were interrogation of prisoners of war, photo interpretation, signal intelligence, counterintelligence, terrain intelligence, military intelligence interpretation, and order of battle. Each of these corresponded to an eight week program that held approximately 800 soldiers per class. In addition, there were a number of specialized short intensive courses, such as close combat. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Most Ritchie graduates ended up as part of a six man team conducting interrogation of prisoners of war. Some days in the field, they would interrogate as many as 5,000 prisoners. In this picture, what you see is a Ritchie boy dressed as a German prisoner of war being interrogated by a Ritchie boy as a mock interrogation taking place at Camp Ritchie. What was critical was that the Ritchie boys used their knowledge of German language or French or Italian, the culture and customs to gather intelligence and break the morale of the enemy. They applied techniques of psychology and persuasion that were taught at Camp Ritchie to obtain valuable intelligence. They didn't deploy violence or torture techniques such as waterboarding. And the results were famously successful. According to one source, an estimated 
one third of all combat intelligence came from interrogation of prisoners of war. From another source, we've learned, and I quote, a post-war army report found that nearly 60% of the credible intelligence gathered in Europe came from the Ritchie boys. Now the most difficult course was the order of battle class. And that required the soldiers to memorize the entire structure of the German army, every division, battalion, every company, so that when an interrogation took place, they could place the soldier they were interrogating in a particular unit or particular division and, and they knew who the commanding officer was and that their commanding officer so that they could use that intelligence in the interrogations. And there were a lot of great stories about how uh, Ritchie boys would be interrogating German soldiers and who would be reluctant to talk or refuse to give up any information. And the Ritchie boy would say, look, we know where your unit was yesterday. We know where they were the week before. We know who your commander was, who he reports to, where your unit is going to be tomorrow. We know everything. So you might as well fill in the missing pieces. Now, what was the training like at Camp Ridge? It was extremely rigorous. Many of the soldiers, when they first came to Camp Ritchie, were quite surprised. One day, they had been in basic training in Wyoming, or Arkansas, or Illinois. And the next day, they were in the um, woods of northern Maryland. The atmosphere there was so different from what they experienced at other training exercises. If you were an observer and you walked into the camp, you would notice, first of all, the number of languages that were being spoken. People would be conversing in French or German or Italian, talking about soccer teams and opera and famous events in the history of their country, very intellectual discussions taking place, very social. They like to get together and share information and talk about their path to the United States and so forth. And it was a very informal atmosphere. These soldiers had placed high in an army intelligence and they weren't as disciplined as on other bases. Now, um, the photo in the lower left on this slide was courtesy of Buck Mosier, son of a Ritchie boy. This was part of an exercise in which mock Nazi rallies were held so that every class that passed through Ritchie would have an experience of one of these mock rallies. And I've seen other pictures where soldiers were dressed up as Goebbels and other high German officials. And it's quite remarkable seeing these photos. Now the photo on the lower right was from Ritchie boy, Colonel Leonard McNutt's collection. And the caption reads, German pneumatic assault boat with assault troops. As you can imagine, the lo uh, local residents were often startled by the presence of Ritchie boys exercising in German uniforms, thinking that the United States had been invaded. It was very common for exercises um, with Ritchie boys 
disguised as German soldiers. Okay, what did the Ritchie boys accomplish? In the book, Sons and Soldiers, there's a quote. In an August 1943 letter to the Camp Ritchie Commandant, Major General Terry Allen described the particularly outstanding work by the IPW, that's interrogators of prisoners of war teams, assigned to his units in the North African campaign. Through their interrogation of German prisoners, Allen said new anti-tank intelligence had been developed that helped defeat Rommel's Africa Corps. The IPW teams had furnished infantry commanders with overlays which showed them practical routes that might not have otherwise been ascertained. Now, it's, it's a fact that within the army, there was sometimes tension between commanders who wanted to ignore or disregard the value of intelligence and just simply charge in to a battle situation. General, Lieutenant General George Patton, however, really valued intelligence. And according to a story by his G2 Brigadier General Oscar Koch, um, as soon as they went into a battle situation and combat, they realized the value of the information from the Ritchie boys. And this is a quote from General Koch. They were not only welcome, they were in demand. And General Patton, again, valued the great intelligence and relied very heavily on Brigadier General Koch and the G2. I wanna read a little memoir from uh, Leon Edel, who is with a, mi a mobile radio broadcasting team. This is taken from his book, The Visitable Past, a wartime memoir. Addressing the enemy required being more delicate than the daily newspaper. Now, Leon Edel had gone to Camp Sharp, which specialized in propaganda, in psychological warfare. They wrote pamphlets to send over to the German troops, encouraging them to surrender. They had mobile uh, radios, uh, speakers that they would broadcast to the German troops on the front line. They published daily newspapers. They ran a broadcasting station. Uh, and to continue this quote, though we had to hammer the German fighting man with a series, series of distinct ideas, the messages themselves had to be gentle, sympathetic, without betraying our hypocrisy and above all, as truthful as possible. Propaganda was usually associated with lying, manipulated by Goebbels. Hitler's pronouncements continued to contain a great many lies. At this stage, they could be contradicted by indirect discourse. Instead of mocking Germany's air force, we could speak casually about having, a, having bombed a certain target. Gradually, the prisoners would begin to tell us that Germany was not being sufficiently defended. And again and again, they were directed to be sensitive to the enemy's feelings. Our leaflets must be persuasive without being coercive. We had to treat our enemy as equals. They were soldiers, we were soldiers. In its stripped down form then, our mission was to inform, comfort, and convince in certain circumstances in a limited battle, we would be using 
vocal persuasion, a human rather than bestial behavior. We would be substituting words for jests. We would employ our vocal cords aided by microphones and loudspeakers and various kinds of print to send messages rather than death dealing missiles. It invoked the principle of inquiry and negotiation, a tremendous step from the training given to us to go into a vocal rampage during bayonet drill. As I prepared to be con convoyed to battlefields, then I could at last rationalize my presence in the army. I was now a media soldier. So this speaks to the approach that Ritchie boys took of using psychology, humanity, to get invaluable information. And they were successful beyond the wildest dreams. Now, some of the individual Ritchie boys had their own individual acts of heroism. They uh, parachuted behind enemy lines on D-Day. They engaged in the Battle of the Bulge and other uh, battles throughout the war. But it was valuable for Ritchie boys, especially the immigrants, because it gave them an opportunity to resist the Germans or the Italians in a way that nobody else could. Many of them were tapped by the Office of Strategic Services to become spies, to uh, go into counterintelligence, go behind enemy lines, gather feedback and information. But more importantly, they came back as loyal, patriotic Americans dedicated to living productive lives and raising their families here in the United States. That ends my formal presentation on the Ritchie boys. I wanna spend a few minutes talking about some notable Ritchie boys, and then we can open up the floor to Q and A's. The first uh, and these are going to be in alphabetical order. Henry J. Abraham passed away just two months ago at 99. He was a retired professor at the University of Virginia. He also taught at the University of Pennsylvania. He was one of the most outstanding Supreme Court scholars in our country. Ralph Baer was in the 10th class at Camp Ritchie, came back and he created the video game industry. He created the Pong and Odyssey video games. William Sloan Coffin was a peace activist during uh, the Vietnam War. Hans Habe was the leader of the mobile broadcasting group. Stefan Hyam was an author, uh, published many books George Jelinek was a classical music host. Philip Johnson, world famous architect. John Kluge was at one time the richest man in the United States and a philanthropist. Cy Lewin, famous artist of the Holocaust. Laughlin Phillips, the director of the Phillips Collection. Eric Pleskow, Austrian soldier who became uh, president of film studios. David Rockefeller was a French linguist. J.D. Salinger attended a short course in counterintelligence and a famous novelist. David Seymour, a famous photographer. Ambassador Richard Shifter is still alive, living in Bethesda. He was the ambassador to the UN. Vernon Walters was also an ambassador to the UN. 
uh, William Warfield was uh, a movie star and a baritone singer. Peter Wyden, the father of Senator Ron Wyden. And there are many, many more. And on this slide, I've put up some information for those that want to go deeper and learn more about the Ritchie Boys. There's our Facebook page, Ritchie Boys of World War II. There's up in the upper left, the documentary film, Christian Bauer, produced on the Ritchie Boys that really got me started in, in this passionate journey. Uh, there have been wonderful books published just fairly recently. Uh, in the lower left is Beverly Eddy's book on Camp Sharp. In the lower right, Sons and Soldiers, published three years ago by Bruce Henderson. On the upper right is Guy Stern's memoir, which is coming out the 12th of May, called Invisible Ink. And there are a couple novels um, written as well. And uh, I've listed some other books, Witness to the Storm by Werner Agress, the Visitable Past by Leon Edel, Pulitzer Prize winning author. And you have my email address at the bottom. And that concludes my presentation. And I'll be glad to take any questions and answers at this time. Okay, Mike. How are we doing with time? Yeah, uh, we got we got plenty of time. So if the folks that have uh, questions, if uh, we got got it on the uh, gallery view here, just kind of uh, if you're on camera, just uh, gesticulate wildly, and I will try to call on you and, and unmute you. Uh, so does folks have any questions? Yeah, raise your hands. We do have some in the chat as well, uh, Bernie. So maybe we can start with those. Um, a nice a nice discussion of uh, Camp Louise and Camp Airy, which I'm sure brings back a lot of good memories for folks. Um, and that there's questions about the current status of, of the land where Fort Ritchie was. Fort Ritchie was closed in, in the BRAC, the uh, base reduction process back in 1999. It has been vacant ever since. It's deteriorating, the buildings are falling apart. Um, there is a community center for the citizens of the area, which has two exhibits on the Ritchie boys. But outside of that, none of the other buildings are accessible. Um, I'm working with a group of people to try to, or to advocate for a museum. There is a potential buyer of the property who is sympathetic to the idea of uh, contributing one of the buildings to be a museum. And that's a rather long range project, but I'm in the process of creating a nonprofit corporation in Maryland, Friends of Camp Ritchie. And uh, a next step would be to create a non uh, tax exempt foundation or organization to raise funds or raise materials that could be used for an archive or a museum. That's a little bit longer term. That's the next project, I should say. I'm, I'm looking at a question uh, or comment. Someone says, uh, I went to Camp Louise, which is just above Fort Ritchie. When I first went there, we used the lake at the fort for swimming. Yes, a lot of people went to Camp Louise, Camp Airy, and the fort was just a mile or two apart away from there. Yeah, I've even known people who had summer residences in that area during World War II, and they remember going to Camp Ritchie um, at the time when it was still active. Let's see. Okay, uh, Phil, Phil Sternberg, you got a question. Okay, I can't think we can hear Phil, you're unmuted, but I 
don't hear you. Um, uh, oh, there you go. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Lubern, do you know about uh, Fort Hunt in uh, Northern Virginia? Uh, and was it, um, I, I heard that it was also an amazing interrogation center that had, um, you know, people from all over Europe um, and it did some really specialized things with uh, very high, high um, uh, value uh, prisoners. Yes, Phil, that is correct. Fort Hunt was established as an interrogation center for high valued German prisoners. My dad was actually transferred there during his stay at Camp Ritchie. And I know that because Fort Hunt is known as PL Box 1142. It um, the soldiers that went there were sworn to the highest secrecy. Uh, our dad never mentioned Fort Hunt in all the conversations we had. He talked about Camp Ritchie, talked about his work as an interrogator and counterintelligence. He never mentioned once Fort Hunt. It wasn't until after he passed away and we found some letters that had the return address. Fort Hunt was torn down sometime after the war. All the records were more or less destroyed. And there's some talk that there were some, maybe some violations of the Geneva Convention and some of the um, interrogations that took place. There's literally nothing available. There's only a marker if you go down to Fort Hunt, um, south of Alexandria, Virginia, there's a little marker mentioning that Fort Hunt was there. It, it's part of the uh, National Park Service. I wish I had more to tell you, but there's not more to, there's not more out there. Did you get my, my question? <laughs> Do you mind repeating it? I'm, I'm not sure okay. which. My question was, this is such a, an important information. It's a real history. Why aren't they teaching it in high school? Well, um, everybody, everybody hear the, the question, why isn't it taught in high school? Right. It's a small piece of history. It's extremely valuable for those soldiers that went through there. But there were 14 million soldiers that went, that served in World War II. Mm -hmm. And this is just a very small subset okay. of that large group. And that was 75 years ago, uh, you know, I'm sure historians, they want to teach civil war and uh, so much else to teach. Mm -hmm. I don't have a better answer than that, okay. <laughs> sorry. It was definitely really interesting. I'm so glad to know about it. Well, the, the people who follow our, our Facebook page are just so enamored by the stories of Ritchie boys and I've only touched on, I haven't even talked about the stories of the Ritchie boys themselves, the individual stories of courage and heroism. You can get that in the book by uh, Sons and Soldiers by Bruce Henderson. Now there are two, Germ uh, two Austrian scholars who have studied the history of the Austrian immigrates to the United States during that period. There were 493 Austrians who trained at Camp Ritchie and Camp Sharp. And these two researchers have written books that are gonna be published, one in June of this year and another in September, one on Camp Sharp and one on Camp Ritchie. It's amazing that Austrian scholars are able to get uh, this information published 
but it's in German. Now, Beverly Eddy, who is a retired history professor at Dickinson College and who wrote a history of Camp Sharp, is writing the definitive history of Camp Ritchie. She's about 90% done with the writing and we're hoping she'll have her book completed by the summer. And uh, I'm looking forward to it very much because it's gonna be a history of the experience at Camp Ritchie. It looks like we have Beverly Eddy on, but maybe just as a viewer. Uh, uh, Beverly yeah. was on earlier, I saw her. Yeah. She may have stepped away. And, and Jordan, Jordan Tannenbaum, did you want to comment on the on the current status of, of the land of the uh, of the base? Yeah. yeah. Um, let me have you in. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, I, the last time I was at Fort Ritchie was probably just about four years ago. I was involved in the bracking effort uh, to um, to close down Fort Ritchie because Fort Ritchie was determined to be a property eligible for the National Register of Historic Places and had to go through a process known as the Section 106 review process. Um, I, that involved spending, and I was at that time in the JAG Corps, um, and I was assigned to Fort Ritchie and spent about six months up there working with the Maryland State Preservation Officer and the then commander of Fort Ritchie to craft a memo of agreement to preserve as many of the buildings as we could. I'm sure I remember that the, the castle was still there when I was there. I'm sure it's going to be, be remain there. The muse, there was a museum when Fort Ritchie was still an ap operating post. I believe it was in the chapel, but I'm not I'm a little fuzzy on that. And of course, there's the incredible gate when you walk, when you drive into Fort Ritchie and all the buildings that are then very methodically stationed as you drive in that, that main road. Um, the, uh, there was, it, we worked with the redevelopment authority, which is the way the BRAC process works to, and had interested a company that did stone masonry to go in there and set up a stone masonry school. I don't know if that's still in operation. It was considered to be a nice adaptive use of the facility because so many of those buildings were built in stone. Um, and, um, you know, the, the uh, so I, I experienced Fort Ritchie in its last days. It was a bucolic place, a wonderful place. They had a little motel up there where I spent, uh, where I was bivouacked, if you will. Uh, and um, uh, and I, I don't remember all the terms of the memo of agreement. I do, I still have my commander's coin, one of the last commander's coins given out at Fort Ritchie, I'm sure, and a nice little plaque from Senator Sarbanes, who was very involved in that effort as well. Um, and um, I currently am at the Holocaust Museum. You might be interested to know that we, prior to the pandemic, we were planning a ceremony at the Pentagon, I believe it was going to involve Ambassador Shifter, uh, that would commemorate Fort, Fort Ritchie and the Ritchie boys, and I, believe now that that, of course, will be done virtually. I'm not sure of the exact date, uh, but more information should be out in the future. Just to update everybody, there have been two attempts, previous attempts, to purchase the property at Fort Ritchie. Both have fallen through. It's been over 20 years since the base was closed and Somehow under the terms of the BRAC, there was funding uh, provided to do some basic maintenance. That has ended and the county is now responsible, Washington County is responsible for upkeep of the property. They do not have the funds to do proper maintenance. A, a buyer recently came forward signed a contract to purchase the entire property, about 600 acres. And it's under legal review. It's supposed to close within 30 or 60 days. And if it goes through as planned, he has committed to providing a building to be a museum 
for the Ritchie boys. And it'd be up to private individuals to come up with funding and, and uh, materials and some kind of financing to keep the museum going. But um, the only thing that's open to the public now is a community center, which again is run for the benefit of the citizens of that area. And it does have a small museum of artifacts from uh, people that made donations. Also the museum in there's a, a Holocaust Memorial Center in Detroit. Uh, I'll be with you in just a minute, Mr. Gable. Um, there's a, a Holocaust Memorial Center in, in Detroit. A guy, Stern, is very active there. And they put on a, an exhibit and they had a conference and a reunion back in 2001. And that exhibit was donated last year to the uh, community center. Um, now, there was a gentleman, Mr. Gable, who had his hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, you're on mute. There we go. Um, when the Allies liberated the concentration camps in Germany, what was the role of the Ritchie boys? There were Ritchie boys, of course, with the liberating divisions of concentration camps. It was a very sad experience. There was not a lot that they or anybody else could do. Some of them understood Yiddish and they could commiserate and be of some assistance to, to help the concentration camp victims. But in their role as army of, uh, officials, there was just a lot, not a lot. In the documentary movie, there's a very moving talk given by an American-born Jewish Ritchie boy who was part of a liberating unit. And he went to speak to the survivors and he couldn't speak. He had totally forgotten his Yiddish. He, he was just so taken back. Now, um, dad's unit, had he stayed with that unit, he would have been part of a liberating force, but he was transferred to another division, which went in a different direction, went into Czechoslovakia. Um, but I've met Richie boys who have been part of the liberating forces. They don't really talk about it. Um, if you read the description, many of them have written about it. Um, it's just a very sad, sad story. Did they, did they interrogate the SS, uh, the SS troops? They interrogated the SS, which was uh, some of the hardest interrogations because those people were fanatic Nazis and they absolutely refused to give any information. Sometimes they had to use severe psychological techniques, which you, you'll see in the book and, and the movie, how they would, in particular, these two Ritchie boys would team up. One would interrogate the Nazi, realize that he wasn't getting anywhere, he would take the Nazi into an adjoining tent and his buddy was sit sitting behind a table dressed in a Russian officer's uniform with a picture of Joseph Stalin 
above him and a little name tag, Commissar Krukov. And it was good cap, good cop, bad cop approach. The first Richie boy would bring the German in and say, well, you know, I'm really sorry. You're not cooperating with us. We don't have any choice. We can't keep you here. We're going to send you to the Eastern Front. And then the other Richie boy would really yell at the German and threaten him and take it. In one, one case, he took a bayonet and popped the buttons off of his uh, uniform. And eventually, they broke them down because there would be nothing worse than to be sent to the Eastern Front. So um, there was, again, a lot of examples. Now, again, most of the concentration camps were in Poland. And those were liberated by the Russians. So you had Dachau and, and others in Germany that were liberated. Um, if you see the pictures of General Eisenhower and General Patton after they visited those concentration camps, you, you, you get a very good sense. There was just no words for people to use. And again, they were in the military, so they couldn't simply, they couldn't do anything beyond what they were instructed to do. Now, I had a question about uh, somebody, it was Claude Kaiser asked about the British oh. equivalent. Claude? You, no, no, you think I'm the British. Yes. There was a British equivalent, and uh, they also were given British citizenship when the Canadians joined. I don't know many details about it. Uh, I do know there's a book called Striking Back by Peter Masters, who was one. And uh, indeed, one of his messages was, this gave the refugees an opportunity to feel they were helping win the war. Not only that, they were helping win the war in many different ways. So that, that was the purpose of writing in this book, writing back. There are a lot of so many stories. details. Uh, I, I do know, you know, because I knew Peter, uh, how good it made him feel to be able to be fighting. That was a message from a lot of Richie boys, that this was their war. They wanted to do this. Many of them jumped at the opportunity to volunteer the day after Pearl Harbor, but they were turned away because they were considered enemy aliens. And you have to remember, there was a real fear that Germans, the Germans would infiltrate into the US Army and into civilian life to spy and collect information. And that uh, therefore there were a lot of people who simply did not trust any immigrant that had an accent. So it took quite a while for some of the army commands and units to really accept that these Ritchie boys were providing valuable intelligence and that they should be listened to. Um, I think Ellen Lampert, who I, I owe a response to. Are you there, Ellen? So I have a, a chat from Ellen that says, my father was a camp liberator and an interrogator, interrogating SS officers, fluent in German, Russian, and Yiddish. He never got over the experience. It scarred him for life. So there's, there, there's another answer. Now a question from Philip 
Sternberg. I wonder if the new Army Museum at Fort Belvoir has a military intelligence display that might include the Ritchie boys. Uh, I believe they're going to have a section on military intelligence. I have not been involved in the organization or development of that museum, but I did have an opportunity to attend a luncheon of the uh, reunion of the 4th Armored Division veterans took place in Arlington. And there were three Army veterans there. It turned out all three were Ritchie boys. Mm -hmm. One of them has since passed away, Harry Jacobs, a wonderful, wonderful friend. Another Ritchie boy um, is still living, Gideon Cantor, lives in Montgomery County. And a third Ritchie boy, Alfred Shahab, is one of the most interesting Ritchie boys. He was born in the United States of Lebanese Christian parents. He joined the army in the cavalry division and attained a very high rank. He is the past president of the Battle of the Bulge veterans. And he just celebrated his 100th birthday wow. with a party. Um, in Maryland, I think it was at uh, Fort Meade. Uh, let's see. I also have online, I see Gary Potishman, who I've had the pleasure of talking with. He's the son of Leon Potishman, who's 98 years old, living in Highland Park, Illinois. Gary, are you there? Can you say a few words about your father? Well, um, from what I know, Leon was born in Poland, February 22nd, 1922. Moved with his parents to, as a young boy, to Paris. Grew up in Paris till his mid-teens and left to come to the United States, to Chicago, um, joined the army, went to Camp Ritchie, and spent most of his service in France as a French interpreter and French language specialist. And he just recently came out of uh, the hospital from a, a illness, but he's back home and doing well in Chicago. There are approximately four to 500 Ritchie boys alive today. That's our best guess out of the 20,000 or so that trained there. Harriet, you have a comment? question. I have a question. Okay. Um, first, apologies because I didn't get on when I wanted to. Uh, and so I, you may have already answered this. But over the years, since the war ended, has there been any kind of um, a, a official kind of coordination of the Ritchie boys, like reunions and things of that sort, such as the uh, Tuskegee Airmen have, you know, formed an association and have uh, lots of ways to communicate, but they're dying off. And secondly, is, was Charles Stein one of the Ritchie boys? To answer your second question, yes, Charles Stein. Yes, and he is boy. still living in um, uh, one of the senior residences in Springfield, Virginia. That's absolutely correct. Uh -huh. As far as a reunion, the Ritchie boys were assigned teams, typically, and if they were interrogators, 
but they basically were operating by themselves as this little team. And after the war, they went back to the United States and they never really felt connected to their, the division they had served in because they had very little interaction with a large number of troops. And some of the other specialists, order of battle specialists or photo interpretation, they operated independently. And they were perhaps in the headquarters reporting to a senior commander. And so they didn't really have a sense of belonging to any particular division. Our dad served with the 84th Infantry, which was made up of mostly uh, recruits from the Illinois area. But then he went to Camp Lee in Virginia and then Fort Meade and then to Camp Ritchie. And he was with a team of six and after the war they scattered and he never really belonged to any fraternal type organization. I only recently uh, joined the uh, 16th Armored Division uh, Veterans Group, which incidentally liberated Pilsen, Czechoslovakia 75 years ago yesterday. And the Czechs are very, very grateful for what the uh, 16th did, and they annually held week-long celebrations. This year, there was a planned trip, 75th anniversary trip, and had to be canceled because of pandemic. But um, that's only within the last five years that I even joined that group, and I don't think the 84th is active at all. So the answer is Richie Boyce, if, if you lived in Chicago, you might have known a few Ritchie boys. If you lived in New York, you probably knew a few. And you may have gotten together socially, but there was never an organized effort until 2011 when Guy Stern came up with the idea of hosting a reunion in Detroit. And I had the pleasure of going there and then decided to get together with three other people in the Washington area. We decided to organize a national reunion in 2012, the summer of 2012. And the problem was there's no database of who all these Ritchie boys were and where they live today. 20,000 people, it's just impossible to try to track every one of them down. So we did our best effort to reach out to organizations and people that we had known were Ritchie boys. And we did have 34 Ritchie boys come to that reunion. And that was held two days at the Naval Memorial on one day. And then the second day was a field trip to Fort Ritchie, which for the veterans was a real treat. I think Richard Jaffe had a question uh, about the specifically experiences of how the Jewish soldiers got along with the others at, at uh, Camp Ritchie. Yeah, hi Bernie, haven't seen you in years. Hi Richard. Um, I was just wondering, what were the actual experience of the Jewish soldiers at Camp Ritchie itself? I mean, for a lot of the soldiers or the commanding officers, they may not have been around or involved with, with Jews very much? And was there still levels of anti-Semitism at Camp Ritchie itself? That's a good question. Um, from readings of memoirs, yes, there were incidents of anti-Semitism at Camp Ritchie. Um, again, a lot of the GIs came from middle America or the South and came with their own prejudices. There were prejudice against uh, African-American soldiers, the, the 12 that came. 
So I would say yes, probably no much, not much more than the rest of, within the rest of society. Um, once they got into the field, I don't recall many, if any, incidences of anti-Semitism. When you're in the foxhole and you're an officer and you're being bombarded with shells <laughs> and you need intelligence, you're gonna trust your interrogation team. And dad never mentioned any instances of anti-Semitism. Now, dad did write about incidences of um, post-war situations where um, Jewish refugees were assaulted or killed when they tried to return to Poland. And so they tried to flee and they would try to come across the border through Czechoslovakia into Germany. And they, they were Holocaust survivors. And he saw a lot of that, of those terrible situations of people not being able to return to their homeland because of anti-Semitism. Thanks, Richard. Okay, I think we, uh, I, we got time for what, but one more question or if you have any final uh, last words. Um, Bob, Bob Jacobs, looks like you have a, you have a question. You have to unmute. I just did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I typed it in before, but I guess maybe I did it the wrong way. All right. Uh, I had a question about, it. was there any kind of formal relationship between the Ritchie boys and the Monuments men towards the end of the war when they were trying to recover the artifacts the Germans had stolen all the artwork and so forth? To the best of my knowledge, no. There was no formal connection. But if you remember the movie, there was a scene where there Go was ahead. a... Uh, a, a young man driving a Jeep for- Harry Etlinger was his real name. <laughs> and he happened on some Germans who were in a POW camp and he spoke German and he overheard them talking about how they had switched uniforms so that the officer could hide. And he reported that up the chain and they were able to, you know, do the proper interrogation. Keep in mind, um, there were many, many other Jews and immigrant Jews who served in the military, like Henry Kissinger was not a Ritchie boy, but he later became involved in military intelligence when they, the unit that he was in realized he had German language skills and could help with interrogation he became an interrogator, but not a Ritchie boy. Now there's um, a comment I wanna mention from Leon Weintraub. It says, you might be interested in knowing that one of the Ritchie boys you cited, Hans Habe, is also the author of The Mission, a novel about the Evian Conference and the role there of the Austrian Jewish physician, Dr. Heinrich Neumann von Hethers. And I know Leon is uh, an expert on the Evian Conference. I just want to mention that these two German, I'm sorry, two Austrian scholars have published books. Well, one is to be released in June and the other in September, one on Camp Sharp and the role of Austrians, Austrian, uh, and Camp Ritchie. The books are in German. They could not get funding. And it's very unfortunate for scholars that want to really get an understanding of the contributions of the Austrians that uh, these books are only in German. And I just learned today from Dr. 
Robert Lackner, that he published a novel that was published this week and that can be downloaded for free if you subscribe to Kindle and Amazon, but it's in German. It's a novel of a Ritchie boy who is parachuted behind enemy lines, gets captured, he has some valuable information, he has to figure out how to get this up to the, the high commands. So there's a lot of interest out there. There's, there's a woman in Columbus, Ohio, who is publishing a novel based on her dad's experience called The Ritchie Boy. It's coming out in September. And Guy Stern's memoir is coming out May the 12th. So it's unfortunate it's, it's the end of the, you know, line for most Ritchie boys. And it would have been great to have these books out earlier, but maybe the time is right. It's possible that the Sons and Soldiers will be made into a TV series. I know Bruce Henderson uh, has a lot of connections in Hollywood and he had one time said that there was strong interest by some producers to tell a series about Richie Boys, but I haven't had any recent updates. Now there's one other comment here. If, if I may just add for a moment a brief, oh. a brief comment about Hans Habe and the mission. Uh, it so happens in uh, media accounts of the Conference of Evian, uh, it was reported that uh, a, a, a doctor, uh, Heinrich Neumann, Austrian physician, was in fact in attendance at the Avian Conference as reported in the New York Times of, of that period. Uh, what he was there for is unclear and not written up formally anywhere, but in the novel, for those who might be interested in reading it, uh, he was sent there by the occupying Germans from, uh, from Vienna. He was sent there with the mission of convincing the, the delegates at the Evian conference that if they were really serious about trying to save uh, all these Jews in what was then Germany and occupied Austria, uh, if they were really serious about saving them, they could, the Germans would agree to let them all go for the price of $250 each. Uh, now, whether that in fact was really what happened, we're, it, it's unclear at the moment, but we, we know there were other attempts in, 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 uh, in, in the process of the war, particularly in Hungary with Adolf Eichmann and the Hungarian Jews who he wanted to exchange for trucks and other vehicles. So this, in fact, may really have happened. But the story itself of all this, of Dr. Heinrich's, uh, Heinrich Neumann's, his visit to, uh, to Evian, his meetings with the delegates, uh, his attempts to convince them, and his failure to convince them, that's fiction as far as we know. But it, it may, in fact, have happened. We don't know. OK, just, um, uh, Michael, if I could do one or two more comments. Yeah, yeah, finish. Um, somebody, well, it's Jordan Tannenbaum wrote, Eric Ross was a Ritchie boy. The Ross building at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum is now named after him. Do you happen to know whether, and, and I would say that uh, uh, Mr. Ross's son is living, lives in DC. And uh, at the time he had made the largest single contribution to the Holocaust Museum. Uh, do you happen to know whether Freddie Mayer, whose story is told in, in Glorious Bastards, was a Ritchie boy? Good question. Freddie was not a Ritchie boy. He could have easily been, but he was grabbed by the OSS. And uh, Mike, is is the uh, is Eric Lichtblau's uh, presentation available on tape? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you can check it on our YouTube page uh, when Eric Lichtblau, the author, author of the, the book about Freddie Mayer, uh, spoke about what was it two months ago? 
Yeah, uh, that is, that is available on our on our YouTube page, and I can share the link uh, uh, when I send out this video as well to to that. Okay, and then someone asked about uh, my uh, email address. It's Bernie Lubrin at gmail dot com. And and here's a comment from Les Bergen. I attended a talk by General Mark Clark in 1967, in which he told us one reason American troops moved considerably faster through Sicily than Montgomery's Brits was the Italian American troops, often raised in Italian speaking homes in New York City. They often had cousins they had never met in Sicily. They went into villages and were informed by locals of German positions. Richie boys probably still classified in 67. Wonder if those troops were Richie boys. Interesting, the name Richie boys. I never knew where it came from, but what I understand is that German soldiers, when they were captured by Americans, really feared interrogations from the Ritchie boys because they were tough and they could get under their skin and they could really get them to talk. And the name came from German soldiers calling these guys Ritchie boys, Das Ritchie boys. And that was the name. And I had never heard the name growing up. I only knew about my dad's individual stories, but I'd never heard until 2004 when Christian Bauer's film came out. I never heard the term the Ritchie boys. Okay, let's try to get the last, last, last couple ones in real quickly. Uh, did you, uh, Elaine Friedman, you had a question? Yes, um, my dad was a Ritchie boy, Harry Marks, and I heard about the Ritchie boys growing up. Um, his first cousin was one of the people in Sons and Soldiers, uh, Manny Steinfeld. Um, there was, in fact, a reunion, and I, I don't know, um, at the time my mom found out about it, I went with her, but I don't know how it was uh, established. It was, they met periodically uh, for a couple of years in the Washington area. Um, one of the sessions we went to hear uh, Ambassador Schiffker, and that was an amazing talk. Um, what you asked about prejudice, and it was interesting because my dad always told the story um, that when we went to the reunion, we heard the other side of the story. The story he told is that the Ritchie boys were all given a password, so to speak because they, many of them had German accents. And if they were uh, captured or if they were found by an American, the Americans might think that they were German spies. My dad had an experience like that where um, he was captured. They heard his German accent and they assumed he was German. Um, and he said, no, 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 my password is Ted Williams. Uh, they said, who's Ted Williams? He had just come to the country, joined the American army, had no idea who Ted Williams was. Luckily, the person that captured him called headquarters and confirmed that he was a Ritchie boy. When we went to the Ritchie boy, and we all always laughed at that story. When we went to the Ritchie boy reunion, we heard the other side of the story, which was many hundreds of the Ritchie boys were killed by American soldiers. When they heard a German accent, they shot before they asked questions. They assumed that they were German. So that was to me just an unbelievable story. Uh, there are many other stories, but I, I just wanted to share that one. That part of the story to my best of my knowledge, is not true. I only know of one instance where a Richie boy was shot and killed 
a friendly fire. He had gone to the latrine, came back. He was asked the password. He either couldn't remember or he gave it in a thick German accent and he was shot and killed. That's well, the at the reunion, they, that's the statistic they gave, that there were hundreds that had been shot. And I was surprised. Yeah, yeah well, th that's factually not correct because in truth, 50 rich, we know 50 Richie boys died in, in the, in the uh, combat zone. And um, two of them were killed during the Battle of the Bulge. They were two inter interrogators from Berlin who had interrogated a group of German prisoners. And within days, the Germans' assault of uh, Battle of the Bulge took place and the GIs were captured and made prisoners. And as they were being marched back, one of the German POWs said to his officer, those two guys are Jews, they're Ritchie boys. And they were pulled out of the group of prisoners and taken to another spot and then they were later killed. It was a very sad, infamous story. One was a young man, had no family. He's buried in Belgium in an American cemetery. And there's a Belgian family that every year goes to his grave and lays flowers for Memorial Day because he had no other family. And it, it's written in quite a number of places about Camp Ritchie. That was the only incident that we're aware of. There, there was a incident where there were uh, groups of Germans that were trained uh, or who, who were fluent English speaking and who were disguised in American uniforms. <laughs> and sent in to spy on the American troops. But Ritchie boys discovered it, reported it. The plan was uh, revealed and these German soldiers were captured and they were, they were shot and killed. Under the Geneva Convention, they were, uh, they had committed violations. And so <laughs> they were shot and you can see uh, films of that taking place, in documentary films. Yes, Harriet. Yes, Bernie. Being as how we're both stamp collectors, here's an idea that popped into my head. Let's get a group together to um, um, advocate with the U.S. Postal Service for a Richie Boy stamp. I'm with you, Postal Harriet. Postal stamp. Yes. <laughs> By the way, uh, uh, there's another connection with stamp collecting. Harriet may recall the story, but back in 2004, I was a collector of Israeli stamps. And in 2004, in the monthly journal of stamp collecting, a Ritchie boy had written a story about Ritchie boy mail, that uh, mail that went mm -hmm. to uh, his parents had sent him mail and he sent mail back to them in Germany and he wrote all about it and at the end of the story he listed his email address and I wrote him and I said I don't know anything about this he said do you know about the movie it's being shown all across the Northeast in November of 2004 I never heard of it and because of that, I went to see the movie at Camp Ritchie, met Guy Stern. And um, that's how I got started in the whole process, uh, the whole story of the Ritchie boys. I had the opportunity to, to meet the veteran, Henry Schwab, who was a very avid stamp collector. He was a cellist with the Boston 
Symphony or Boston Opera and um, had a pleasure of meeting him and two of his buddies up in Boston, oh, maybe eight or nine years ago. So that was quite an experience. So you could say stamp collecting got me started in this Richie Boyce. Mm -hmm. Well, let's figure out who we talk to and get them some information. Well, I'll follow up with you, Harriet. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid we do have to wrap it up here. We're just about out of time. But I want to thank everyone for being on. And we'll be doing another one of these next week at the same time uh, on uh, World War II aviation and development of microwave radar. And we'll have an author, uh, Norman Fine, along with a, uh, George Jacobs, who was a uh, navigator on B-17s. Uh, so that should be next week at 3 o'clock, same time. So hopefully we'll see some faces soon. And thank everyone uh, for being here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.